This video is published under the Creative Commons license BY and CSA, which means attribution, non-commercial and share-alike. Third-party material has been used for which the permission is specified explicitly for every diagram, photograph or whatever has been used. Please mention the author as Andreas Pfennig, Products, Environment and Processes, Department of Chemical Engineering, Université de Liège, Belgium. A disclaimer applies. Welcome back to this video series on thermal unit operations and we are still in the section on general considerations and in this video I would like to talk about the average component flow rate. Now one may ask why is that relevant? Well the average component flow rate defines if a component is moving in a distillation column for example in upward or in downward direction. In a general countercurrent process if it's moving preferentially with the L dot or with the G dot uh, flow rate that is, it determines at which end of the process you would expect it in the product. And we will see that from that result quite some statements about what can be separated and which problems may possibly occur. Now we want to use balances again to solve that, uh, to answer that question, what is the average component flow rate? To set that up, let's have a look at a general theoretical stage, which is again plotted here. So we have a stage N. Uh, it's a theoretical stage and we want to regard for simplicity actually that we have carrier flow rates L dot and G dot passing through that theoretical stage. The, that means that on the other hand side we need to talk about loads if you want to characterize the corresponding compositions and so the theoretical stage N, uh, to the flow rates are leaving with the compositions Xn and Yn. So again, we in use the index of the theoretical stage for those flow rates that are leaving that theoretical stage. Since we are again counting our theoretical stages from top to bottom, from the top we have the Xn minus 1 entering and from the bottom the Yn plus 1. And now we want to look at a balance plane which is shown here. And we want to define a positive motion through that plane as uh, in this direction, so preferentially with the G dot. So G dot defines our, the flow rate of G dot defines our positive direction. Now this doesn't always mean upward and the opposite downward. This is true for distillation presumably or absorption. But in general, if you look for example at solvent extraction where you have a countercurrent process as well, which you can describe with theoretical stages, uh, there you have, for example, in a mixer settler battery, it's arranged horizontally and then this positive means uh, indeed only moving preferentially with the G dot and negative means moving preferentially with the L dot. Of course, we assume that within that theoretical stage, the two phases are ideally mixed. So on that stage, we have these compositions Xn and Yn. And since we set up the balance for that theoretical stage, we actually only need to regard components and compositions that relate to that theoretical stage. And because of that, for simplicity of notation, I will directly skip that index of the theoretical stage. So we will regard an xi and a yi, and we are always referring to that level, so to speak, our balance plane in our counter current process on that theoretical stage. And since it's a general, it applies everywhere. Now we want to set up, so to speak, the balance, what is passing through that, and we want to describe that in the following way. We want to name that variable that characterizes that as an n dot i. n is the amount of substance, n dot is the amount of substance per time. So it's a flow rate indeed of component i. And we have defined in positive direction a contribution which can be characterized as the g dot times the y i. That's apparently the flow rate of component I in positive direction. Minus the L dot times Xi. Apparently the L dot is a negative direction, so that is a contribution on that theoretical stage in negative direction. And now we can rewrite that to a certain extent. We can regard, uh, we can rewrite that by rearranging the variables uh, as, so we scale, so to speak, with the Lxi uh, times the g dot yi divided by the L dot xi minus 1. And here we realize, of course, that we are on the theoretical stage where we have equilibrium, which means y over x characterized by equilibrium. 
can be written as the partition coefficient, which we know already, ki being the yi divided by the xi. And we can substitute that to obtain n dot i equals l, or should be a dot here, l dot xi times g dot ki over l dot minus 1. Okay, the next thing that we can regard, that we can observe, is that actually this uh, g dot ki over l, that is, uh, over the l dot, is actually a variable that is quite well known. It's the lambda. Lambda equals of component i is the g dot ki over l dot. So we introduce that here. And in distillation absorption, this is the so-called stripping factor. In solvent extraction, it's the extraction factor. And I assume that there are other separation uh, unit operations, so possibly it also has other names in other uh, separation processes. So it's a stripping or extraction factor that is quite important. And we, we will see in a moment why that is so important. So with that, we can rewrite the equation to yield n dot i equals l dot xi times lambda minus 1. Or we can also, well, we can also divide that, so to speak. We can say it's the n dot i divided by the l dot xi equals lambda minus 1. And I write the different forms because the arguments that will follow will depend on uh, either of these, these forms. And now we realize that actually if you want to look well in which direction is my component moving, is it moving in positive direction, that is with the g dot, or in negative direction with the l dot, we can see directly from this equation here. This will be positive, that is with the g dot, if the lambda is larger than 1. So we can write, if the, uh, I'll write both variables, so the lambda e i equals g dot ki over l dot. If that is larger than 1, then the component is moving with the, in positive direction with the g dot. If it's less than 1, it's moving with the l dot. Of course, it's the net motion, the net movement of that component. It, uh, if you are, so to speak, at one end of the process, so the separation performance is not 100% until the end of the process, then you will always also have some product or some trace of that or certain amount of that in that corresponding product, even if the overall direction is in the, other, is in the opposite direction. So actually this only moving with that g dot is only limiting case. If you have an infinite number of theoretical stages, then overall the component will only end or will exit the, the process with the g dot or with the l dot depending on this lambda. In reality, there are some uh, mixes due to the uh, limited separation efficiency of a limited number of theoretical stages that you can have. So that way we realize uh, if we have, so to speak, a multi-component mixture where the g dot over l dot is, for example, constant over the entire process, which we realize is one of the typical assumptions, which is mostly not, not such a bad assumption, at least not for such general considerations, then it's only the ki which defines, so to speak, if the component is moving in upward or downward direction in a distillation column or with the g dot or the l dot in a general counter-current process. That means, of course, in turn, if we have really a multi-component mixture, which has many components, where the ki of these components are, so to speak, defined, we can select our ratio g dot over l dot such that we get the so-called cut between the components exactly at that point, so to speak, where this is a distinguishing, so that for certain components it's positive and uh, larger than one, for other components it's less than one. So by adjusting the g dot over l dot, we can um, define where we want to cut between the different components, some components preferentially moving with the g dot, the others preferentially moving with the l dot. Why can we vary that or how can we do that? Uh, then, of course, in, in, in distillation, for example, uh, well, the g dot over l dot 
as we know, is defined by the reflux ratio. So we can adjust the reflux ratio to really have a certain amount of uh, certain components at the top, certain components moving towards the bottom. In a general countercurrent process, one of these flow rates will be specified. It will be given. It's that flow rate that is your that you need to. Uh, regarding your separation, it's an inlet flow rate from previous process steps and then you can typically choose, as we have seen already for distillation, we can choose the second flow rate such uh, that uh, we reach the corresponding separation goal on the one hand side and on the other hand side we can also take into account economic considerations like with the reflux ratio for the distillation. Uh, so if we assume that the L dot is given, for example, that's defining the flow rate that needs to be uh, separated. And then we can choose the G dot in order to achieve the corresponding separation. And then we realize apparently that uh, the Ki of the different components together with that G dot, so to speak, define where this component I is winding up. Of course, the partition coefficient is given for the typical for the system. It can be influenced by the choice of the extractant or if you have an auxiliary component that you use extraction or absorption for example you can choose these components they define the Ki once that is given all the Ki for the components are specified and then you can choose your G dot such that for some components they are moving in one direction and the other components are moving in the other direction and by the choice of G dot you so to speak select which of the components are moving upward and which are moving downward. Of course, they will always move in the order of their Ki. So you cannot have one component with, uh, with a very high Ki, which is suddenly moving in the downward direction or with the L dot. That doesn't work. It's always in the right order. So the, the order of the K defines the order that you can, so to speak, separate. All above go one direction, all below a certain value go the opposite direction. At the same time, we realize that if the lambda is exactly one, Hmm, something strange happens, then the overall flow rate is zero. Well, can that occur? Does that occur? Where is that relevant? And I will give you an example for that. We return to the presentation. There exists an example in very early stages of, of uh, chemical engineering. It was the air rectification, separation of air by distillation. And of course, you have your main components, nitrogen and oxygen. And if you only regard them, you know, 20 or 70 percent, uh, 79 percent and 20 percent roughly, uh, then of course you realize the nitrogen has the lowest boiling temperature, that is, it, uh, it is the um, uh, light boiling component, whereas the oxygen is the heavy boiling component, which means nitrogen is your top product in distillation, and oxygen your bottom product. Easy, simple. You may overlook that there is roughly one percent of argon in the air, and that unfortunately has a boiling temperature which is in between. Which means if you regard the partition coefficients, the Ki of the different components, that will also be in between. So the partition coefficient of the argon is between that of nitrogen and oxygen. And if you select your reflux ratio in the right value, with the right value, then actually for the argon, in the overall separation of nitrogen and oxygen, for the argon, the uh, lambda will be exactly one the stripping factor will be exactly one. What happens? The component doesn't move at all. It will stay in the column. It will accumulate in the column. So a so-called um, argon bulge forms. Uh, in German it's called argon bauch, so argon belly actually, if you would uh, translate that literally. That builds up and well then of course you realize that's not a steady state condition anymore. Such a build up is not steady state and eventually it, it will move to either side, to the bottom or the top of the column, and it will lead to off-spec uh, products, either of nitrogen or of argon, depending really a little bit uh, on, on the situation, so to speak. So you will have a transient situation, a non-steady state situation at a certain point, and one calls that, or one called that formally, I think it doesn't occur anymore because today you know how to handle that, but before, before it was called the burping of the column, because there the argon was leaving to the top or the bottom. You can avoid that actually by, have a, by having a small side withdrawal somewhere in the column and this um, 
argon bulge will actually move to that point where you have your side withdrawal within certain limits. So if you have somewhere some side withdrawal, some small flow rate only, that is typically sufficient to remove sufficient argon so that uh, you get your main components with essentially arbitrary purity and from that side withdrawal you can actually separate the argon and that's one way to, uh, or that's the way so to speak how argon is typically produced uh, in with starting so to speak with this separation and then a second separation afterwards for the purification of the argon. Okay so there we see that actually this regarding this average flow rate is quite important because it tells us so to speak what can happen how to separate different components and let's uh, skip back to to the uh, to the notes so we see so to speak that we can separate how we can separate and um, we can also see of course that we uh, can not separate certain components if two components have the same ki yeah, then we see here so to speak that the relative flow rate, so independent of the composition, so if, if that xi is very high for one component, then of course correspondingly the overall flow rate of that component will be high, so that is normalized away, so it's a relative uh, molar flow rate that we have here. That defines, how to speak, how many molecules per time are moving in either direction, and there we see uh, that also depends only on the flow rates and the k the partition coefficient. So if for two components a partition coefficient is identical, you are not able to separate those components, not with this separation technique. So with that, two phases between these components have to separate, you know, equilibrate. Which means, of course, as soon as you have same uh, part, uh, partition coefficients, separation is impossible, as you can see, for example, for azeotropes in distillation, or if you have a multi-component mixture and two components have the same partition coefficient, that will of course very generally apply as well in solvent extraction or wherever. Of course there are certain ways around that. You realize that on the one hand side of course the partition coefficient may depend on some boundary conditions. For distillation for example the pressure partition coefficient is slightly for many systems only slightly pressure dependent. So by changing the pressure you may be able to separate the components. On the other hand side, actually that's the reason why there are other separation techniques than extractions. One of the reasons. Because if you have two components that have a vapor-liquid equilibrium where their partition coefficients are quite similar, separation doesn't work by distillation. So you have to use other separation techniques, other unit operations like extraction, absorption or whatever, where you now can choose your extractant such that you are able to discriminate the different components because in different equilibria of course the partition coefficients are completely different because they are determined by of course all by the molecular, inter molecular interactions but they are different completely different uh, in liquid-liquid extraction as compared to vapor-liquid equilibrium for distillation, for example. So by regarding these very, uh, very generally, this overall net flow rate, so to speak, of a component, we are able to realize which components to separate, which we cannot separate. We realize how to set the cut for a multi-component uh, mixture and we also can see what happens if we choose accidentally, so to speak, the g dot over l dot such that for some component which has a certain k, certain partition coefficient, the lambda accidentally uh, should be a unity. So we see that from this average flow rate we can learn quite a lot and with that we want to go back to the presentation. To summarize and to have the take home message, we realize that the flow rate of a transfer component is characterized by this g dot k over L dot for that component, which is the lambda that is the so-called stripping extraction or whatever factor. And we realize that if this is larger than one, the component is preferentially moving with the G dot. If it's less than one, it moves preferentially with the L dot. And we have seen all the consequences of that in the discussion. With that, I would like to say thank you for uh, this video and I hope to see you again in the next.